Um, my name is Jason Nardi, and I'm here today to talk about the social and solidarity economy and if and how this is influencing the EU's policies. Now, um, I don't know if I can speak from there because you're all so far. So would you mind coming forward a bit? It would really help also a bit of a dialogue unless you want to just listen the whole time. And it's okay if I speak English, right? Only understand English, okay, fine. Don't, don't be shy, come on. Hello. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, tell me when, when you're ready, we can start. Okay, from what I understand, you're part of different uh, uh, parts of the master, like uh, A, B, C, or something like that. So who, who is part of which? Can you tell me something about it? Hello. Uh, the coordinator of the PD. Ah, voilà. And I will be the, the one uh, assessing the students today and uh, in charge of watching you. <laughs> okay, parfait. Thank you. Okay. So major A focus on digital transition, major B on digital transition, and major C on ecological transition. And D? D, there is no D. Ah, B. D. B. D. Okay, B. Uh, it's mainly macro. Uh, and uh, you also had two students here uh, who, are, who, are, who are much more specialized in macro, macro monetary. Okay. Monetary policy. Okay, very well. And just, yes? I was about to ask, how many of you are, have a, good knowledge of what SSE is. Good enough. Know what, what, what we're talking about. Okay, maybe about a third, almost half. Yeah, it's not one of the focus. Okay. So interesting. And then if I understood well, there will be some discussants. Yeah. Who are the discussants? Ah, voila. So you're the ones on the first row. Almost. Yeah, because there are assessment details. Okay. Very good. So um, I will go a, through a presentation I prepared to give you a general picture of where I come from and what I work in, what uh, our approach to social solidarity economy is, because there are many different approaches, and then will enter the the uh, fun realm of policies at the EU level. Uh, and there you will, you, you know, depending on your interest and on what you're working on, you can ask me or interrupt me um, as much as you want. I was thinking that in the second, you know, the second part could be much more interactive. So, if we're all here, we can uh, we can start. So first of all, this question, the answer to this question is no. Um, social solidarity economy is not transforming uh, the EU social policy. What is happening is it can influence parts of it, but mostly it's the opposite. It's the EU that is transforming the creative uh, 
and spontaneous nature of social solidarity economy, uh, putting it into its market normed framework. And we'll look at that uh, further. Of course, that doesn't mean that we cannot interact and try uh, to change and transform it, especially at the local level, uh, regional and national level, but we will look at how that works later. So my uh, experience is at different levels. In Florence, Italy, my, my home city, I am part of several groups, uh, cooperatives, community groups, committees, um, working on, on, on different issues, mostly to try to create uh, local uh, economic circuits. That is, bring people together uh, in different forms to buy locally, for instance, from the local farmer, um, to have repair shops or, uh, you know, uh, reuse uh, uh, and share uh, uh, tools uh, to create community groups and fight for issues that they think are important in, in the urban and rural settings. If you want later on, I can give you a few examples uh, of this. Then I work at the national level. Um, I coordinate the European, uh, the, the, the Italian Solidarity Economy Network, RIES, Rete Italiana di Economia Solidale. This network brings together about 30 territorial networks all over Italy and some of the sectoral networks like fair trade or the uh, agroecology and food policy network. Um, the Renewable Energy Network, and so on. And finally, I'm part of RIPES. RIPES is the intercontinental uh, network. And in every continent, there is a coordination, which came out from a long, well, not that long, actually, because it's only uh, a bit more than 20 years old, uh, 25 years old uh, process. Uh, globally, after the 90s, which were the year of the, the years of, of the main UN summits, um, then there started a process of convergence between different movements, the ecological movement, the human rights movement, the feminist movement, and so on. And um, also <clears throat> the economic uh, democratization movement, let's say, uh, sort of grew out of this. Uh, as we were entering in a new phase of uh, globalization uh, after the 80s and the 90s uh, in the year 2000. Uh, so there were some first meetings in Latin America where there was a very uh, live movement. And uh, there are some moments in the history of these social movements that are important for the formation of social solidarity economy worldwide. Each time, every four years approximately, we had a global meeting uh, and in a different continent. And that's where the uh, continental networks then uh, started to, to take place. At the same time, we gathered in uh, some global movement um, convergences like Seattle uh, when the World Trade Organization had its uh, uh, first round and and uh, display of civil society opposition. Um, many movements came together uh, to say we want trade uh, not as a commodity, but as a democratic form of exchange between peoples. And in Brazil, the World Social Forum has been since 2001, a very important place to strategize together in opposition to Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum, that's why it's called World Social Forum, and where we uh, get together to discuss about social policies. In, uh, in 2008, we had one of the biggest financial crises. Um, I don't know what, where you were, at what level of your education uh, you were there, but uh, uh, there the sort of the financial issue became very important. Finance evidently was dominating the economy and deciding 
how the economies should work and also uh, having a very strong influence on, on uh, state policies. Um, and that's why we had movements like Occupy Wall Street or the Indignados that uh, sort of demonstrated to, to stop this, uh, this uh, growth of, uh, of uh, a finance without control, without democracy um, that was coming out. And if we go back to Europe, in 2016, we had the Brexit, the UK separated from the European Union, and also the, the whole political scene in the European Union started to change. Um, a lot in the Eastern European countries with uh, democratic authoritarian regimes, um, but also this wave is coming back um, in the more progressive countries as well. And finally, this I'm sure you are uh, quite aware of, we had the COVID crisis, but as part of a poly crisis or sing crisis, um, not just an isolated pandemic, but part of a crisis of, uh, that brings together different global aspects from the ecological climate aspect, um, to the economic financial aspect. And again, has demonstrated how we're all dependent and interdependent uh, at a global level. And the reaction to this is how do we regain our uh, democratic sovereignty as uh, citizens uh, by rethinking the economy? Um, so the European uh, continental uh, network of solidarity economy was founded in Barcelona just 10 years ago, um, well, 12 now, and it's made up of 44 members, oops, I did something here, sorry. Hope we can get that through, 44 um, networks that, Voila. Um, I hope that doesn't interrupt also the uh, the transmission. No, should should be okay. Okay, forty four networks. What are these networks? There are some big networks like in Spain, in Portugal, in France, uh, in Italy, that are more traditional, uh, have a longer traditional history of uh, citizen uh, organizing in different forms, cooperative forms, mutualistic forms, um, social enterprises, etc., And that go back to the workers' movements uh, of the 19th century uh, and have evolved throughout times. Um, and these are uh, today in many different forms. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the interesting evolutions in, um, in the EU is that each country has a different way to approach uh, these forms of uh, enterprise initiative, of economic initiative, of community uh, welfare initiatives that uh, are brought about by, by uh, citizens which makes it interesting, but complex, because for instance, we don't have a common uh, form of association in Europe. Each uh, country has its own norms on how you associate, uh, or even for mutuals. We have since 2003, um, 13, sorry. Um, oh, this is the, I don't know how much you see it, but sort of the network across Europe. We have also some initiatives in uh, now uh, getting closer, both in Ukraine and in Russia. Um, not an easy moment for that. Um, and the so the the, the sort of the panorama is very very uh, pluralistic, and uh, that makes it a, a big challenge to address the European Union in general with its different 
uh, institutions, the council, the parliament, the commission, uh, because each one comes from a different cultural historical uh, approach and also juridical normative approach. So what we do in, in, in the European network is first of all, we try to help the, uh, uh, the creation and, and, and the strengthening of local ecosystems um, and circuits of and practices of social solidarity economy. Many of these are in the food agricultural field, but there's a lot in, in different productions and services. And also now in the digital field with open and free software uh, developments <clears throat> and the use of these for the creation of cooperative platforms that bring together uh, different initiatives that can exchange uh, on both a local and translocal basis. So that's the first sort of area of uh, an objective that we have as a network. The second is the recognition of all the vast uh, development of social solidarity economy. Now I'm using social solidarity economy, although the network is Solidarity Economy Europe and the EU use social economy and the French use social solidarity economy. And you've probably heard of social enterprises and the UK and the Anglo world uses social business, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are not the same thing. So they're used many times as synonymous but they're really not the same thing. They're part of, if you want, a large family of nonprofit third sector organizations. Although for instance, Solidarity Economy uh, refuses the idea of sectors, uh, and the private sector, the public sector, we'll see this, and instead thinks of an integrated form of economy where public community or social and private merge together. The third is uh, what I was saying before about merging and doing alliances with other social movements. For instance, with the ecological uh, and climate justice movement, uh, with the eco-feminist uh, movement, with uh, the agroecology and permaculture movement, um, with the commons and commoning initiatives uh, that don't have yet a formal network, but have different uh, coordinations among them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to do this, we promoted initiatives like the World Forum, Social Forum of Transformative Economies in 2019 and 2020. In 2020, it was supposed to take place in Barcelona, but of course we were, uh, obliged to do it online. These are the main organizations that participated. Here you can see some that are um, sort of quite large and, and, and uh, um, bring together sort of more institutional forms like FEDEA, which is the Federation of Ethical Banks and Alternative uh, Banks, uh, or FMDV, which is the uh, the Federation to Develop uh, Cities, um, but there are also very radical and small uh, groups as well. And the idea here was, what do we want to transform? Um, there are four sort of dimensions of transformation that we are trying to approach. One is power relations. We want to transform power relations from concentrated power to distributed power and distributed uh, leadership. Also in our organizations, and this has to do also with the patriarchal culture we have, with the organiz organizational culture we, culture we have, the business culture we have, um, and the education that comes with it. The second is knowledge and culture. Again, instead of privatized closed knowledge, we want to open knowledge and free knowledge. Uh, culture is a commons and should be freely uh, available and distributed and education should follow uh, the same. We want to, to transform economy and finance from competitive and growth based and profit based to nonprofit cooperative 
and limit based, based on the limits of our ecosystems um, that take this into account and integrate it in the design of products, of services, uh, of policies. And finally, relationship with nature. We need to transform the way we relate to nature. Uh, as the extractive economy is destructive and not regenerative, therefore we have to think of how we can um, really uh, change completely the way we, we uh, do exchanges um, in a way that does not destroy the environment in which we live. So these are very macro kind of themes, but for each one, there are many different practices and policy ideas that uh, we discussed. I think everybody is aware of this, but what do we do? Um, there's a new generation, if you want, that uh, is the generation of the financial crisis of 2008 and subsequent ones. We've seen big uh, movements. This is from Chile a few years ago um, that have <clears throat> come up and, and made people conscious of, of this uh, and of the fragility of the, of, of the whole system. The progress we had done on many fields like workers' rights, et cetera, are now put into question the even existence of our uh, planet is put into question in, in a certain sense. At least this is what many youth movements think. Um, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Fridays for Future or, and, and others are fighting for justice within the ecological um, uh, domain, which means uh, if we want a future, we have to really preserve uh, what we have. And finally, I mentioned here a few um, authors, Ostrom and Bollier, who have worked a lot on the idea of commons, uh, because this is another stream that is emerging as a counter reaction, if you want, to the uh, strong neoliberal globalization uh, that we are li living, which is and which explains the word solidarity. What do we mean when we talk about social solidarity economy? Well, the word solidarity can have different meanings. Um, what we mean by it is the strong democratic binding that there can be in a solidarity relation. So it's not a charitable form. It's not someone giving to someone else. It's a relation where of mutual help. And it's a political relation as well that um, comes out with, with forms of self-organization, with community organization, and with uh, the idea of a care economy that um, uh, has a very uh, profound democratic approach, which means everybody has a say in, in how we do things. And finally, the idea is to shift from a very anthropocentric vision um, towards a more ecocentric or cosmocentric vision where uh, we are not sort of the center of everything and can use everything as we want, but we are part of an organic uh, uh, and complex uh, weaving of life and we have to take care of that. So I'll go a bit forward. I'll leave you the, uh, the slides, but uh, I really want to get to be a bit more in, interactive and also go to the policies. Um, but first I would like to say that social solidarity economy is different from previous uh, economic approaches because it, it really is based on practices on how you change things from the ground, rather than from a, a, a framing theory that defines what you have to do. So from the practices, inductively, we derive then the sort of rules and principles um, that we, we bring together. And what are these practices? 
Well, uh, as I said before, many are based on our primary needs. So local food supply chains, community supported agriculture, solidarity consumer groups. Uh, the idea of agroecology, which is not just how you produce, but uh, it's about the cycles uh, of nature. It's about the social implication uh, and so on. Fair trade and also the sort of new waves of fair trade that are also domestic. Mutualistic forms of finance. And here you have a whole world that opens because we are so used to the idea of money being um, sort of something there uh, that you cannot change, but really money is a social contract and we can create our social contracts. And that's why there's so many new initiatives for local currencies and social currencies and alternative currencies that thanks to the technologies that we have today, it's much easier to use. Um, we can also use cryptocurrencies for a solidarity economy. And we can use the idea of, of tracing, of tracking, um, the and of privacy uh, protection uh, to enable uh, economies that are out of the competitive competitive market, out of the um, sort of global regulations. And then I'll go faster, <clears throat> just to list um, all the different forms of recovered factories owned by and and managed by the workers, and and. <clears throat> different co-working forms uh, and self-entrepreneurship, collective and co-housing kinds of uh, reappropriation of our housing rights, um, community centers and the use of collective autonomous spaces where many different initiatives work together. Um, these are in France called tiers lieu, um, third places, but uh, they're developing in many different countries. Ecofeminist and care economy initiatives um, that look at how to depatriarchalize our, uh, our uh, society and uh, the economy. And then renewable energy collectives and communities, uh, which is also very interesting because it brings together um, the idea that you can produce not just food, but also energy locally. Um, and you can be a user and a consumer and an investor at the same time. Uh, and you can share the energy that you produce within a local circle and also uh, understand how, how uh, it works. And then this is finally the, what really characterizes solidarity economy is the idea that it's not just by changing uh, an enterprise, making it most, more social, more ecological, uh, careful, uh, more democratic, uh, more cooperative that you change things really. It's collaborating uh, at, at, <clears throat> with many others uh, and, and, and recreating supply chains, for instance, or recreating circuits of economy that um, or, or, or having solidarity economy zones that then can implement all the different um, principles that we talked about. So um, if we want to be future capable, we have to think differently uh, and regain the control of many of the things we lost um, in, in, in this economic system. And as I was saying before, the idea is not so much that we create a third sector that is nice, that uh, is careful, that has different, a little different rules, that repairs what the other is destroying, et cetera. And that has its little place. It's actually not one third as it seems here, but it's much, much smaller if you calculate it in financial terms. You would have a financial sector that covers 90% and then you have a public sector and then you have the third system. But a, uh, the idea of concentric circles 
from the local going to the translocal, to the regional, to the national, et cetera, and the different collaborations that can take place. And you can have community cooperatives, which include local authorities, include the university, include um, informal and formal initiatives, even include private initiatives, but that are sort of uh, uh, in this ecosystemic uh, vision. And each one has a different role because the, uh, the public provides with a provision of planning for the collective, the private provides for a interest group and the social provides for a community uh, in the large sense. So if we bring these three together, we can really um, have a working economy. Okay, I'll go a bit further. Um, some of the initiatives we are working with others uh, are exactly in this direction. So we're trying to bring together what are all those initiatives that are really transforming our cities or, or um, territories. Um, so we have this sort of award that's called Transformative Cities. Um, that we do with uh, other networks like Friends of the Earth, Ecolis, um, HIC, which is Habitat International, et cetera. We try to map around Europe what these practices are. And we've done, we've done a mapping of mappings called Transiscope. Uh, for now, it's very Francophone based, but uh, we're enlarging it. And it's like a search engine, but you find there uh, and you can select if you're interested in food, energy, clothes, clothes uh, whatever uh, you're looking for. Um, we're also working on trying to influence, at least at the national level, uh, how we can build back from crisis like the pandemic in a fairer way. Um, we've seen that next generation Europe, which is the European policy for recovery and uh, rebuilding is, let's say, green oriented, um, but how much fair and social is it? Um, I invite you to uh, read through the, uh, uh, the policies that Europe is putting through because, uh, well, they're not so fair. And they're not even they're not even so green because it's talking about green growth and it's sort of transferring uh, sectors without transfer without changing the model uh, of economy that are used. Um, we are working with many municipalist movements. Uh, these are movements that are rethinking how we organize politically together at the urban level um, and trying to uh, put into policy those practices that we're, we're talking about. We're working with climate uh, justice movements more and more. Um, impossible not to today uh, integrate Something that first, maybe years ago, was not that important for social economy and for social solidarity economy, but today it's, it's, uh, it's become one of the pillars. And we're working with intentional communities. For instance, eco villages or, or uh, uh, rural communities or permacultural communities. These are groups of people that sort of organize their life uh, in, in an independent form of community um, beyond sort of the social uh, um, normative construction. And talked about energy communities before. So the challenges we see now um, are mainly if, if you want to think of new forms of, of structures, new forms of organizations uh, and try to see if there's an opening in the EU policies to introduce these. We have some openings uh, I, and I'll 
tell you which in which field. But what we're looking for is uh, we need to change the, in the how how the relations of work are are today. Uh, the worker should be also who decides, um, and there shouldn't be this power relation uh, that we have. So. How do we do that? Should everything become a cooperative? No, there are many different forms uh, that can be created. There are many confederated forms. There are many um, hybrid forms. Uh, but what uh, needs to come into place is some regulations um, that define, for instance, the minimum and maximum wage, not just the minimum wage, but also a maximum wage. Um, not to have such a huge difference between workers. For instance, um, community social enterprises that are owned by both the community and the city. And why not think of cooperative municipalities? Why can't you organize a municipality in a cooperative way? Instead of just voting once every four years or five years, you could have a much more frequent way of voting. And I mean, countries like Switzerland put that into practice uh, already for a long time. And then <clears throat> there's a whole public sector uh, that can be managed by the citizens directly. Uh, and this is the non-state public sector um, with collaborative ma management uh, regulated in, in, in some way, but then left autonomous to the community to, to manage. Are you following me up to now? Any questions? Yes. No, no, no. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it's transversal, actually. Um, when in 2010, the Greece collapsed uh, because of the European pressure, um, uh, the all of a sudden the, the Greeks found themselves without. Uh, welfare uh, in a general sense, like hospitals closed. Um, uh, they, they had uh, less access to, to um, um, you know, public support, banks, uh, et cetera. Um, so they self-organized and created uh, uh, um, forms of, for instance, um, voluntary or or non-voluntary, but community uh, paid uh, uh, clinics, uh, solidarity clinics, they call them. And even the pharmacies created uh, forms of solidarity uh, uh, interaction am amongst them, uh, whereas before they were acting as normal uh, businesses. So this, means that in moments, and, and also during this COVID crisis, there have been many uh, spontaneous initiatives, but how, once the spontaneity, let's say, ends and the emergency ends, how do you integrate this into a more formal uh, approach and a long-term approach? Uh, well, that's where we need to change the idea uh, and organization of our of our public institutions um, and of just representative democracy. We need to have more interaction between different interest groups <coughs> inside the institutions themselves. And in what forms? Well, a cooperative form is one of these forms because it allows to have both ownership and decision-making shared uh, among the stakeholders. So that's something to, to really think about. I don't know if I answered your question, but no, there are not yet. 
we're not we're we're very far from this, but uh, at a very small scale, there are attempts to do it, and uh, probably we will see uh, as we're facing one emergency after the other, these forms emerging spontaneously and then being integrated in some way uh, in the future. <laughs> okay. So, um, as I said at the beginning, since sort of the 90s, there's the emergence of this. I wouldn't call it a movement because it's more uh, a very fraction and pluralistic form of practices, but that constitute a different approach to the economy. And together with this, there are other Approaches, approaches like degrowth, like the transition towns or, or, or others that you may have heard of. All of them have uh, this idea of uh, relocalization of the economy after uh, a period where it has been delocalized and, and, um, and where growth has been sort of the, the main um, driver. Uh, if you want to have a look, there's a website called socioeco.org or even the ILO website uh, to legislations if you're interested in the normative aspects. Here you can find all the legislations that have been done until now by nation, by um, if they're framework laws, if they're instead just uh, sectorial laws and things like that. But what we really have gained in the last years is uh, a sort of constitution for social rights inside the European Union. And this is called the European pillar of social rights. Does anybody of you know about it? Okay, it's a short document, but very interesting to read because there, they're spelt out as in the constitution, all the different rights. I'm, you can't really see them well here. It's a bit blurry, yeah? Um, and it defines, for instance, what gender equity means, what equal opportunities uh, mean. Um, it's a lot focused on, on uh, uh, the right to work, but also to be cared for. Um, the work-life balance, uh, social protection, uh, minimum income, un unemployment benefits, health care, et cetera, et cetera. All that care part, let's say, and, uh, and uh, the rights of the communities that uh, make sort of uh, Europe after the Second World War what, what it uh, has been, spelled out in a very... <clears throat> interesting uh, way. Now, is that put into practice in the policies? Not really. So um, what we've been advocating for is to have measures uh, and actions that the EU then uh, asks the states to uh, apply. So in 2021, the new commission and the commuter, commissioner uh, for jobs and and uh, <clears throat> uh, and I don't remember all, all his uh, things. Schmidt um, has promoted a social economy action plan. Uh, this plan is now one year old. Let's say it still doesn't have the the uh, sort of uh, implementation measures, but it spells out all the different aspects uh, where the uh, public institutions can favor uh, the emergence of the uh, social economy. Now here they, they use social economy because they still have um, sort of the, the, the French approach, the old French approach before the 2014 law of defining uh, social economy by its legal uh, definitions. So you have the cooperatives, the mutuals, the, the foundations, the associations, and the nonprofit organizations, let's say. 
uh, now they added the social enterprises. But what we're talking about is not sort of sector or legal basis, but the approach you have and, 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 and the, the, the way you, you uh, do business. Uh, in the parliament, there is an intergroup for social economy. Uh, and we have worked with some of the uh, parliamentary uh, families groups, in particular in 2015, 16, and 17. We promoted together with others, this uh, European Forum for Social Solidarity Economy that then led in some way uh, and contributed to the Social Economy Action Plan. Uh, this intergroup is a mixed uh, group of MEPs who meets regularly to discuss how to advance and strategize in, and bring together the, the commission and the council. Uh, we also did a campaign to vote for the MEPs and the parties who were more uh, in line uh, with the principles and uh, of social solidarity economy in 2019. We're going to do a new one for the next elections. Uh, again, together with many other um, uh, networks. This last year, 2022, um, the European Commission promoted a series of uh, events and especially this conference in Strasbourg uh, to discuss the different aspects uh, for the implementation of this plan. And then there are other institutions that are doing a lot of work on social solidarity economy and recognition of it. The OECD, for instance, um, is helping to produce a lot of data and analysis uh, that is needed because that it's, it's almost invisible today uh, to most people and, and also to politicians. Um, and then there's the role of local authorities. And this for us, these are our, our closest allies because our communities, our practices, our initiatives, the, the social solidarity itself is a local kind of approach. So the closest institution is the municipality, the, the region, uh, or different uh, local institutions. So we've been working with, and some of these are our members as well of the European network, uh, with national networks of local authorities uh, to see how they can promote uh, the local ecosystems. For instance, simplifying the, the bureaucracy uh, and the access to financing, uh, reinforcing the role of local governance um, and developing social innovation or allowing for social innovation to develop, um, encouraging the participation of citizens in many different ways, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is a good response from many of the local institutions, even on different political sides. So this is quite transversal. And finally, uh, we're working with local authority networks that go beyond the European spectrum. For instance, the Global Social Economy Forum, which is a member of RIPES and we are a member of them. Um, this, this, these strange interactions uh, are what make uh, actually the, the uh, sort of the, the governance uh, of these networks work because they're not vertical networks, they're intertwined networks. But in this case, um, every two or three years, uh, the, this network organizes a forum for uh, champion local authorities that are really out there um, developing uh, many, many innovative uh, ways to, to deal with things. And this year will be in Dakar. Uh, so we will interact with uh, our uh, African uh, colleagues and there will be a special focus on youth and women and their role in uh, developing social solidarity economy. 
that's it. Um, I won't go through the example, just show you a few pictures, but um, you probably heard of, uh, of CSAs or food co-ops uh, or things like that. If you live here in Paris, uh, there's Les Louvres uh, in near Gare de l'Est, which is a food co-op uh, on the example of uh, a similar one in New York, but now they're spreading all over. So it's a little supermarket owned and managed by the consumers. Now that's not something very new because there were such things in the 18th, and nine, well, in the 19th century already, but the difference is the way uh, it is governed and managed. And um, it's, I invite you to go and have a look. Um, I talked about solidarity clinics and pharmacies, uh, energy co-ops, uh, schools that are cooperative, social markets, et cetera, banks, insurances. You can have a car insurance. You can have um, in Spain and in, and in Italy, there's, for instance, and also I think in, in France now, um, there is a uh, cooperative internet providers, et cetera. And then local currencies, which are interesting, but still at a very experimental level. And then there's the whole world of culture and art that uh, is uh, also organizing in, in, in different cooperative ways, bringing together makers, commoners, uh, artists, peer-to-peer, -peer, groups, et cetera. I think I finished, yeah. Thanks. Um, and now I'm all for you. Yes, but first of all, we are going to hear the discussion. Yes. Very good. Uh, and, and then we open the floor You need other chairs here or You can use mine if you want.
You can you can take the red uh, USB. Yep. So just said, when is not working? You cannot connect to the Okay. So you will connect another one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, hello everyone. Sorry for the minor inconvenience. Uh, my name is Nada from Egypt, uh, alongside my colleagues uh, Rutuja and Angela from India and Montenegro. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, share our thoughts about social and solidarity economy, and um, yeah, share ideas about governance and uh, growth. So. Yeah, the outline is as follows. We're going to talk about uh, social solidarity economy between principles and reality uh, and the different forms. And um, uh, Jason sent us um, ILO and OECD resolution or recommendations for government uh, about social solidarity economy. So we're going to criticize this a bit. And finally, Rutuja will talk about challenging ideas of growth and governance. And then we'll open uh, as, as usual to questions and discussion. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> social solidarity economy is proposed as an alternative to capitalism and other authoritarian modes of governance, um, and its principles are uh, voluntarily uh, <clears throat> autonomy, independence, voluntary cooperation, mutual aid, so you can see it's very ambitious and radical in a way, uh, but what falls under uh, social solidarity economy, uh, the, the usual uh, or the familiar forms are cooperative and mutual associations. And we can you can see it's it to an extent covers the principles of social solidarity economy, uh, but also we can argue on how democratic uh, is governing the governance form of it and also the scale uh, because um, smaller cooperatives uh, are not the same as big ones. They face more challenges related to funding and organizational aspects. <laughs> What I want to talk more about is um, the model of social enterprises and foundations. As you know, social enterprises um, are like trying to mix the social <clears throat> with 
the uh, the business mindset. Uh, so it receives multiple of criticism about an extension of the new liberal welfare logic and how to balance this conflicting between our institutional logics between the market and social services. <clears throat> and as you know, they work uh, with, um, can we say like underprivileged people try to produce goods and services and make, make them enter the market. So concerns related to social washing, commodification of the communities they serve, and the idea of the scale, because they're highly uh, scalable. So as they grow, to what extent they're still um, fulfilling these needs or serving the community. However, I believe they're still relevant in context where freedom of association and cooperatives are limited and where the governments fail to um, provide the principles of welfare state to its people. So I believe it's still uh, relevant. Uh, <clears throat> and foundations are like transfer of personal personal wealth to, uh, to personal foundation. And they have advantage, advantages, tax uh, conditions, and remain under private control. So they can be more related to the idea of philanthropy that doesn't tackle the root causes uh, of the problem. Uh, finally, I'm going to give uh, two remarks on uh, ILO and OECD uh, recommendations about social solidarity economy. I found it, it's very growth oriented, let's say, like they're treating social solidarity economy entities as, as a startup or a small enterprise. They very great emphasis on their access to finance, venture capital, establishing private partnerships, get business development services, and less or fewer emphasis on uh, the social and environmental impact and the idea of community building. And second, second remark I had, it's, it's a bit contradicting. So it recommends government to combat what they call CEDU, um, social and solidarity economy, entities that violate workers' rights and make unfair competition with compliant uh, entities. But this made me think like, can the strive for growth and scalability for social and enterprise, social solidarity economy entities uh, drive all um, entities to be CEDU in the long run? So this was my remark and hand it to Angela for more uh, notes on. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Nana. Okay, so as Nana made an introduction about ILO and OECD reports and their assessment of social economy, which is, yes, growth oriented, we still wanted to take their approach and their policy recommendations in that way, just to see the current state of Europe and their assessment of social uh, and solidarity economy. Now, OECD report uh, provides nine building blocks of social economies in their sense, but we wanted to focus on these three, which is support, access to finance and funding, enabling legal and regulatory framework, and finally, straightened skills and business development support. So. Okay, first one, uh, access to fun finance and funding. You can see by the OECD states, uh, government should develop and pursuing where possible a comprehensive public funding strategy for the social economy in compliance with regulations regarding aid to enterprises to improve the long-term financial sustainability of social economy organizations. Just a sneak peek of how international organization uh, works and thinks about social economy. But the current state, now in, in, in our system, we just want to give a bigger picture of how it looks like uh, to start a business by itself, not social enterprise, but just a business. There are many challenges where, for instance, you can be a woman entrepreneur and be 25% less likely to receive bank loan for uh, regarding to your male counterparts. Or if you receive a loan, uh, they typically receive smaller amount, pay higher interest rate, and are required to secure more collateral by the research. Uh, other ways of uh, assessing these is you can be immigrant or youth entrepreneur, where again, in system we are operating now, access to finance by the banks, it's much more constrained and less sensitive. Uh, and if we look social entrepreneurs by themselves, so your white male over the age of 27 want to do a social enterprise. Uh, now there are two ways, either EU funds or traditional ways of 
getting a bank loan or some kind of investment. Now, what's been found that EU, with all the pretty websites about social economy, many social entrepreneurs are co complaining how it's very much bureaucracy heavy. And so many of them don't even want to go down that road of long waiting, long paperwork and such, and just disregard EU funding from that. And on the other side, if you want to do the more traditional way of financing your social enterprise, uh, once again, not a surprise, banks are very confused and not sensitive to the, this hybrid model of doing business, where you have social out outcomes and a still service and product based model. And lastly, uh, the threshold for starting a social uh, enterprise is usually uh, between uh, 100,000 and 5,000 uh, euros, where this is too big for donors or philanthropists, but it's too small for institutional investors. So we can conclude just from the policy recommendation to the current state, either way, uh, traditional system is not working, but at the same time, the umbrella institution that is promoting this kind of way of operating economy is also flagging in promoting it the right way. Uh, speaking of institutions, when it comes to a legal and a regulatory framework, they are advancing efforts to harmonize definitions of what social enterprise is. So this is important, which we talk about, there is many uh, ways of viewing social economy and solidarity economy and how it's perceived in different regions in different countries. So there is a need for social taxonomy. And again, if we're speaking about Europe, we still have institutional framework lacking where you, European Commission is slacking the assessment of your uh, social taxonomy. Where it stated it's not going to happen before 2024 where that mandate ends and the new mandate probably is going to lack technical knowledge about this so uh, overview of social taxonomy is probably not going to happen anytime soon and lastly uh, we are talking about straightening skills and business development support where the uh, in OECD report they put emphasis on uh, enabling knowledge beyond universities and schools which is something we couldn't really access to, but we know it exists, but there is no base to see which projects exist and how to access them all. So we try to focus on more traditional ways to see if social economy is incorporated in schools, universities anyway. So still no comprehensive study on EU countries on uh, SE education, just five countries doing their own kind of assessment report. We're France, Greece, UK, Italy, and Spain. Uh, so that at master level programs related to social economy, there are 40 courses in France, 25 in Italy, 16 in UK, 9 in Spain, and 1 in Greece. And their overall conclusion is they're more general in terms, like not really assessing what social economy is and like special particles about it. Uh, they are employed by traditional pedag pedagogical approaches. And lastly, collaboration between higher education institutions and SE actors uh, usually uh, is at the del delivery stage rather than the development of programs. Now, having uh, memorized all of what both Nanda and me said, we can now move on to the final part and talk about challenging ideas approach. Uh, hello, my name is Rutuja. I'm from India. Um, so I'm going to be talking about challenging ideas of growth and governance, specifically from a more institutional perspective. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, first off, why is this important? Uh, because institutional structures have been designed at present to support neoliberal firms and businesses. This is what they've been doing for many years. They've been focused on improving policies, and that's how they have improved themselves. But now there's a different requirement from social solidarity networks, and they want different outcomes, for instance, changes in distribution. And so then it becomes important for us to challenge what growth, what governance means from more institutional perspective. So uh, it, First, to talk about growth, when we were going through the OECD and ILO policies, uh, I felt as though there was an assumption about what growth means. And growth here fundamentally means the scalability of the same organization. 
uh, but perhaps it's important to see to recontextualize to reimagine what growth can really mean from a social solidarity perspective uh, for instance in evolutionary biology there's a mimetic understanding of growth where replication is more important than scalability in, in and of itself which might be a better way to understand growth here specifically because uh, social solidarity economy is looking for distribution of um, economic wealth, which can mean dis distribution of productive structures as well. Um, and of course, there can be many other understandings of growth. Hopefully, some more will come in the discussion we have. Uh, finally, governance. Uh, governance within social solidarity networks seem to be gaining political flavors, not just economic flavors, uh, which is to say that we have to understand governance from more political angle as well. Uh, and But this can mean that but even though we are talking about democratic tendencies, it's important to then look at democratic tendencies as not just meaning one thing, which is one vote or um, uh, one vote per person or one vote, one share, uh, but can can mean a lot of other things as well. So, for instance, in the argumentative Indian, um, Sen argues about a more public debate based uh, governance, which I think the professor also spoke about, uh, which might be more appropriate for cooperatives. And further, if there's a if there's a serious challenge on uh, how governance can change, uh, it would also be interesting for communities that have been traditionally not part of this conversation, say women, for instance, with uh, um, with different cycles around childbirth and periods, etc., to also be part of changing how this governance looks like. Um, we can also include more indigenous communities, and uh, as the professor already spoke about, more interwoven kind of governance that might be more appropriate moving forward. Forward. And uh, so accordingly, uh, the big question I have is, uh, what is the kind of change that needs to exist in academia and uh, policy in terms of our understanding so that uh, social solidarity networks can be supported? Uh, Based on all of this, we have uh, a few questions for Professor and also for the class. And um, uh, maybe... Um. Yeah, thank you for listening. We have two parts of um, questions. Uh, let's start maybe. Yes, how far are we now or the EU from the radical, the initial uh, ideas of SSE as an alternative to capitalism? And our SSE entities are making so many compromises in the EU that are no longer resemble their own principles. You want me to continue or to answer first? Maybe let's take um, the three. Each one of these can take a break. We have to. Yeah. Mm. So maybe I'll can you take the time. So yeah. yeah. We have one hour. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Of course. Yeah. Um, okay. My second question was: uh, How can SSE entities uh, thrive in undemocratic contexts? Um, which form of SSE prevail more from your experience in uh, in the the network? Um, I saw it has a network in Africa and in Latin America. Uh, so, can the less radical forms? pave a transition towards collectivity and emancipation or towards more new liberal form. And last one, in the strive for growth, how can SSE entities navigate this conflict? Any best practices you observe? Okay, I have the microphone. Okay, hey, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I... I think these are all... Uh quite challenging questions. Uh, so as I, as I said at the beginning, um, when just starting, I think the, the risk of <clears throat> being absorbed uh, by the, the way the, the European Union frames social economy is really high. Um, and the capacity we have as actors in many different fields of the social solidarity economy to influence and, and protect uh, what we're doing uh, from, from this being, being co-opted, being absorbed, <clears throat> is weak. So we're not in a good position to start, okay? Uh, but at the same time, 
um, we have uh, also gained uh, a lot of experience from our attempts or work that we have done at the local, national uh, levels. And we're trying to understand how we can interact at such a, a sort of a high level where you have our governments interacting with lobbyists, with uh, different influence um, uh, to which we, do, we have no access. Um, and <clears throat> that of, of course are, are much more powerful than what we can be. And the media, which is not very attentive or, or, or sensitive to our issues or distorts them sometimes um, because it has a, it needs to, to tell a story that has some patterns that are not the same patterns or don't go at the same speed, let's say, uh, that uh, the media wants. Uh, for the more entertaining uh, and attention capturing that it needs. Uh, so th those are, are, are quite big challenges, but we try to renew ourselves every time and to learn from, from, from the, the, what is happening, to adjust to the new political context. And in history, I mean, uh, it's many going a bit towards the second question, but then I will go back to the first. Many of these initiatives have uh, started uh, in undemocratic uh, environments and contexts and have developed in an informal way. And then um, finally they have emerged uh, because they have been able to answer to the needs, to the real needs of people. And, and, um, and when, when, when that happens, uh, then there's sort of a, um, from, from a niche, it, it, it becomes much wider, okay? So if you look at the history of the, of the cooperative movement in Europe um, and the workers' movement and the, Emancipation movements and and uh, I mean they they have gone in waves. Um, they have there have been times where they come together and other times where they act separately. And now is a time where we're trying to reconverge. Um, as I was trying to uh, tell you throughout the, my my presentation, the last ten years have been really a, an attempt to bring together the different. Uh, social movements, the different, um, uh, not only political, but practical uh, experiences uh, to, to form a, a, a common but plural voice that can be heard um, by, by the institutions and that uh, can also try to uh, prevent the capturing of, of of the concepts. Uh, this is happening with social business and social uh, economy. Um, and we're trying to contrast this capturing because when we talk about impact investment, venture capital and all these things, uh, these are exactly the means, the ways in which uh, you commodify uh, and, and you uh, create speculative investment in a social field. And you take it away from its primary purpose. So to serve a private interest. So we're very careful at, at, at this. And um, I think that, you know, one, one thing is looking at the, these documents, these principles set out by the OECD if, or the ILO. The ILO last year focused totally on how social solidarity economy can uh, become a new sort of new, a new way to bring together the tripartite uh, form it has, you know, the private sector, the public sector, and the representatives of the workers. Um, that's positive. 
how it will be done, that is something that uh, we, we, we have to work on. This did not exist just a few years ago. Um, so now the light is sort of moving uh, on, on our field while we were growing sort of in a, under, under the, the ground like mushroom uh, uh, networks. Now it's surfacing and there's uh, a lot of interest to, to that, that we have to be careful not to, not to give up. That's why we have to reinvent ourselves con continuously. And also when we ask for recognition, we are not asking for normative framing that um, sort of defines one model for all. We're asking for a space uh, where these ecosystems can, can grow and thrive and can find the means um, that don't make us dependent from the public or from the private. So when we're talking about financing, uh, why we need to concentrate more on ethical, mutualistic, cooperative financing is that we have the means. It's just that if everyone keeps them for themselves, um, then we, we won't create the, 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 uh, the, the sort of the, the form that is needed, which is simply sharing, rotating, and cooperating, cooperating uh, to, to have the resources and also invent our resources. Um, I wasn't joking about the, the creating our money. Money is a social contract. It's, it's a creation. Why can't we create ours? If we need to satisfy our, our means and, exchange, and, and forms of exchange, why do we have to use, um, you know, uh, something imposed by an institution if all we need is something that helps us give value and recognize that value among each other and trace that, you know? May I quickly follow up that how, how would you be able to sell the idea of complete decentralization and to, to the institutions and to the private sector that you want them to collaborate with you? Like, if you... Yeah, it's just... How do you communicate the level of radic radicality or the 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 form you we want to do with with government and with uh, with private sector or international organization that would probably want to keep the status quo? Yeah, um, by doing and challenging, by creating new new forms, by implementing them uh, at a very small and local level, by connecting them then we can sort of try to open up and integrate with others and we can ask uh, the public system to recognize. But first we need this, this space of sort of uh, less visible interaction. Um, and also trying to transform the economy means, can we do it from within? No, that's one of the questions you had or, or, uh, I mean, I think for us, the answer is no longer a, a, an issue. No, capitalism is not reformable. That's a certainty for, for, for us. But can we interact? Yes, because we are immersed in the market system. We cannot make believe that we aren't, but we can create some, some islands of cooperation that are not so much influenced by it. And we can ask for recognition of social currencies, for instance, at a local level. So if we have public recognition and not opposition or criminalization, then we can continue to develop. The, the, the problem we face today is when uh, something that we're doing becomes illegal all, all of a sudden. This is happening also with in, inside the, the private uh, initiative world. Think of the development of cryptocurrencies, totally unregulated. Now they're uh, regulating it. That's serving private interests, not, not sort of the common or public interests. Um, but until now it has been free to, to develop 
as it was, you know, and, and, and we can learn from also not so positive initiatives, let's say, um, in, in, how, in how to do this. I think to answer the, the issue of the democratic context, we've been working a lot in, in Eastern Europe as a European network, um, both with, uh, with youth and with the existing more social business initiatives. Uh, and I think there's, uh, there's a lot of space there if, if again, we, we work transnationally. That is, we support uh, these initiatives from outside and that helps them feel less, uh, less alone less, and, and less fragile. Um, in 2012, we worked with, 2013, we worked with the Greek government um, and that helped create a framework law. And now with difficulties, but it's developing a um, SSC and there's a space that is recognized to interact with. Um, we're hoping to, to be able to do th similar things also in Eastern European countries. In, in, in Tunisia, uh, also there's a new law, but it's very um, sort of, uh, how could you say, market-oriented. Uh, but the initiatives on the ground, the networks on the ground with which we work are not. So we're hoping that they will gain more voice and will be able to influence uh, more. It's a, it's a slow, long approach, but um, uh, navigate the conflict. Yeah, um, I think, and this is my last remark because I'd like really to, to, to leave space for, for, oh, you have other questions or, oh, ask them. Yeah, but um, just to, to on the issue of growth, since you focused a lot on that. Now, first of all, there's an ambiguity in the use of the word growth because many public institutions use the word growth to mean development and development has been used to mean growth. Um, so uh, both terms are, um, you know, quite ideological, uh, even if they are presented as objective. But what kind of growth and what kind of development um, and who brings it and how is a fundamental question because we might want to develop our community and, and want to grow the well being, the, the, uh, the care for the environment, uh, the levels of education. Um, you know, we want to grow all of these things, but we don't want to grow uh, pollution, um, extraction, uh, and destructive uh, use of, uh, uh, of natural resources, uh, uh, and uh, especially uh, the uh, exploitation of people. I think we don't want to grow that. Uh, but that comes with uh, forms of private interest that are not regulated. So uh, we tend not to use the word growth uh, and to sort of refute it. Uh, and we're very careful with the word development because um, when we talk about a less developed country, uh, developing what? Uh, but we, we, uh, uh, we, we look at more the, the issue of is uh, f fairness, justice, um, and uh, equal opportunity and, dis and distribution um, being respected or promoted. That's what, so we use instead the, world, the word well-being or welfare or, or well-living. Our um, 
Latin American uh, uh, colleagues are now working on a liberation economy based on <clears throat> the liberation pedagogy and philosophy of the of the 80s and 90s uh, because they they uh, say we need to free the economy from sort of the capture that it has had with the with the idea of profit and growth um, free it from that and make it go back to its original uh, sense which was economia the norms for the care of the house of the of the of of, of our community. That's what economy really is. And in fact, and I close with this, um, we just had our uh, yearly strategy meeting as European Network a few days ago here. And some of us were saying, why do we continue to use, uh, you know, whatever adjective economy instead of using just the economy? Because that's what we're claiming. Re reclaiming, we're reclaiming the real uh, economy and it's in, in what it should be. Uh, so it's the others that are alternative economy. <laughs> we should be using just the word economy. Okay, now I propose that we open the door. Uh, so let me suggest that when your question um, is out, yes. Uh, so maybe you want to see first um, those gestures, just one person. Um, that one, two, and the third one, please. And no, thank you. So, oh, we have, no, we have four questions. Is that fine for you? And don't forget to introduce yourself. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. And to my colleagues, I am I come from Uruguay, um, South America. And I would like to ask you at the first of the at the beginning of the presentation, you were saying that it's not really the um, social solidarity economy influence in the social policy from the EU, but actually the way around and considering that the EU is not really proposing a paradigm shift in many aspects. Um, how would you say then that at the repes, at the um, network level, that like the what's the position of the European um, uh, member of the network, let's say, and their influence on other uh, members? Like, is there like a sort of horizontal relationship, or would you say that there is actually some degree of uh, neocolonialism or, or like imposition of certain ways of doing things for which we know Europe is famous for. Um, yeah, that's my question. Okay, okay. You're, you mean inside the network? Yeah, 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 like the, the power relations. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering because... Um, yeah, okay, I'm Christina. I'm from the Czech Republic. Um, and um, uh, yeah, because you are saying that the, uh, you're, you're not saying that everyone or every uh, organization should be a cooperative, but we just had the uh, discussion yesterday on cooperatives and uh, we thought uh, we saw a few examples where even like the cooperative system uh, or the cooperative structure didn't, didn't really go with the, uh, the like purpose and the, uh, uh, rules of the solidarity economy and it was very much like market-based and hierarchical so uh, and also I saw your map of the different projects uh, uh, that you presented and uh, there's a lot of different types of organizations so I was wondering like how do you assess that something belongs to the solidarity economy and especially for the uh, like uh, uh, cooperatives where even um being a cooperative doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, they don't exploit workers or environment. Yeah, thank you. So now... Hi, I'm Quentin from France. Uh, what, what's your name again? Quentin. Quentin. And uh, my question was, 
Well, you said that uh, we should rather not call it solidarity or social economy, but simply economy. And whenever I present myself as an ecological economic student, because I'm from the C major, people are like, what does that mean? Because when we talk about economy or economics, or people already think about capitalism. So like if we like if you want to present social and solidarity economy as just economy, then there is a problem of how do you educate people about that if they will just simply assume that you're talking about capitalism. And I think that's a broader issue of how to educate people about social and solidarity economy. What are the yeah, ways to do it? Yeah. Um, last question. Hi, this is, um, I'm Gwen from the Philippines, and uh, it relates sort of to Christina's question, um, but in, more in terms of like investment in financial, like um, there are situations or, I mean, how can we ensure sort of inclusivity or genuine sort of social eco economy, right? Um, and especially when there's investments and, and money involved. So kind of like the way maybe in real estate there's ways to be like okay this is a good loan um is there is that kind of mechanism um but to ensure inclusivity and and just um just transitions i'm just wondering if there's that that exists or something that's being worked on okay thanks for the first way let's see whether we have time for the way please okay take the time to answer very interesting questions. So I don't remember the name of uh, you from Uruguay. Joaquin. Hmm? Okay, so Joaquin. Um, let's see how, how to answer this. I've, I've been, uh, I had the, I don't know if the privilege or uh, <laughs> the experience to coordinate the uh, intercontinental network for four years as we rotate our coordination from one continent to the other so that it's not always the same um, who, who is doing that. And of course we have different styles, different uh, priorities, objectives, but the idea of, uh, a cord of, of uh, the coordination of the continentals, of the continental re networks is not that we have to all have the same uh, ideas, policy, or et cetera, but that we, we find the, the means of cooperation where we have uh, similar, uh, similar issues, similar needs, uh, and, and also similar objectives. So it's sort of a space of collaboration, let's say. And we co collaborate uh, on advocacy towards the UN, for instance, the United Nations, um, or, or other international institutions. Um, we're pu pushing, for instance, for a UN resolution on SSC that maybe this year will, will come out. Um, we collaborate on education and exchanges of uh, both uh, for for students and uh, in universities and or or for our initiatives to learn from each other so it's a peer learning kind of thing and we collaborate on communication um that said um it's actually more the opposite because we've been a lot influenced by the south american uh, solidarity economy um and in fact um, the, the European network was born 10 years after uh, the, the rest. Uh, mainly because, not because it didn't already exist in some informal way, but uh, because uh, Europe is such a in, uh, multicultural, multi-language, uh, multi-political, <laughs> let's say, uh, space that it's much more difficult to get together. Um, where, whereas where you speak one language, be it in the Anglo-Saxon world in, or, um, or in Africa where you have mainly uh, the 
the francophone and the anglophone languages beyond the local languages of course um then <clears throat> there's and of course we all come from the idea that we have to decolonize our imagination decolonize our, our our ways of doing so i would say we do this effort uh, a lot um but uh as as for the influence of the eu on on our practices it comes mainly by the policies they do to finance uh, these activities or to promote private investment in these activities as i was saying what we need is instead recognition of the mutualistic and cooperative forms of, of financing if they grow then we don't need public financing and we don't need private financing but we need a space uh, a legal space to be able to do that in a much more efficient way um so that's a bit the the, the approach um second question christina uh, the one of the things we're working a lot on is how do we measure evaluate um determine the the uh, we don't even call it impact but the social utility of uh sse uh with our with with the uh you know for the purposes that we we do things and it's quite a tricky thing because it depends who you are um uh, who you want to measure it for is it for the initiatives themselves to be able to learn from their mistakes uh and and uh become better on on different uh, levels uh so it's is, is it sort of a self-assessment uh, uh, that you need to to progress is it to um, get access to finance uh, uh or to uh pu public recognition um is i mean there there are many different objectives that you could cover and therefore there are many different methodologies um there's labels and guarantee systems like in the fair trade uh, or organic uh, uh, agriculture, et cetera. So there are ways of saying, okay, this is a product that is done in a certain way, um, uh, not only ecologically, but with no exploitation or uh, um, short circuit, et cetera. There's um, some more complex forms of, uh, of evaluation like the economy for the common good measurement system or um we're, we're working on uh on the model of the so of the spanish network they do a social balance for all their members so all the all the members have to every two years uh assess where they are uh with equal rights uh environment uh, uh the governance, uh, territorial impact, et cetera. There are six different dimensions that they measure. And that's what says if you're in or not, okay? Which doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Uh, and nobody has a score, let's say, because it's not, the idea is not of scoring or being better than someone else. The idea is if you can um, strive towards and improve uh, as, as you go. Then for the consumer, which is another of the publics, you do would do something like that. You have to communicate it in some way, and uh, that's that's not easy. There are also uh, many different things. What we we're trying to push is for uh, a label of transparency that says, for instance, not just what ingredients are in a product, but where they come from, what kind of supply chain. Uh, you know, so the traceability uh, of it, uh, the the kind of uh, um, price distribution, cost distribution, how much profit goes to one, how much goes to to another, all 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 of these aspects. And today it would be really easy if 
and and there are some tools that have started to do it you know you go you you have a qr code or something like that and that will bring you all the information on on that product so um the, the difficult thing is to gather the information to, and to proof proof it see that it's correct because if it's only self-evaluation then you have to just trust um how do you educate people about economy uh that's that's another big issue because as um I don't remember who was, was saying about the uh, masters that there are in, uh, you were addressing it in, in, in a few countries in, in Europe, but it's not only about higher education, it's about the whole education cycle. Um, how is economy taught in schools, if it is? Um, uh, well, how um, it is, not it's it's an interdisciplinary thing and it's not just looking at the, the students of economy but uh political science sociology anthropology etc so the multidisciplinarity is a very important aspect uh of this especially if you're looking at social and political matters and no we won't be able to to say economy until we can change the culture around it uh, but we have to continue we, we we have to not call the capitalist economy just economy we have to define that also so if we're defining ourselves we also have to define the other and not just leave them the uh the sort of general general cultural definition uh otherwise we're we're making we're confirming sort of that uh, that thing so uh you should address a capitalist economy as capitalist economy or uh, you know be be more precise when when you talk about something like that um yeah i um, did i also answer your question or you had some other nuance okay no but you you can go more into detail if you could say that that's a perspective from that perspective if I was an investor or something, I wanted to get an investor, how would I choose what I'm going to invest in that? Um, well, I can tell you from some experience uh, I have with the finance cooperative I'm a, I'm a member of um because one of the one of the main thing is um direct knowledge like we're we're not the kind of uh thing you would invest in by looking at some data online if it's going up down or you know what rating it has from so and so etc uh it's it's based on trust and trust is based on direct knowledge or someone you trust who tells you about something so since there are so many variables and so many criteria involved it depends on your interest or you're interested more on the ecological aspect and 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 what kind of ecological footprint uh or carbon footprint that has and then it depends what what uh, convinces you more um, of those kind of indicators um, on the social indicator? Does it mean something? Um, because these are like the generic kind of data you find uh, that uh, this creates jobs. Yeah, but what kind of jobs? What quality of jobs? And uh, how are they? Uh, uh, what kind of retribution is there? What kind of benefits? or rights are respected in that job or the kind of equal opportunity are there so you have to break it into a, a lot of things that usually you're not inclined to to go through you want one measurement that and that kind of composite uh, uh, indicator 
is very difficult to do because how can you communicate it? You're not just communicating one very fine uh, information. You're communicating a lot of different, very different kind, kinds of, of, of things. So what we try to do is we, we look at our principles, we see how our principles are translated in criteria, we see how these criteria can become indicators, and we look not just at the sort of the direct impact that these have, but what we call social utility, which is a larger concept um, that is still being developed and defined, um, and that looks at both the uh, um, the uh, sort of who generates and who who receives uh, at both ends. So we're 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 not just looking at the beneficiary, let's say, or the consumer, or the we're looking at a bit the whole chain um, and um, and how to aggregate that that data. Uh, so there are attempts. I was mentioning the. Um, the economy for the common good, Felber uh, in Austria is sort of the initiator of this uh, thing. It's it's a quality quantitative system, uh, but then there are, it, this goes up to B corps, the B corporation that is a totally different way of of doing because that. Um, Okay, they're both volunteer based, but um, one is looking at much more at um, some some um, sort of functional criteria for the enterprise, and uh, the other is looking at uh, more the relations that are created. Um, between the, the the scope, the action, and the result. So they're 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 really very different. I don't know how to answer a question like that with you know because I cannot give one answer. <laughs> they're, they, we're experimenting many things, um, and now we're looking at this um, the, the this way that the Spanish are doing, which looks promising. Um, REAS, you can look in economiasolidaria.org. It's mainly in Spanish, though. Um, and we have some projects to share these methodologies and try to develop them together. Um, that's exactly what we're working on in the last two, three years. Okay. Uh, so there is. Uh, one more question. Please go straight to the point. Okay. One, two, three. No, three, and that would be at the end of it. Okay. So uh, maybe I will start at the back of the room. Yes. Hello. My name is Lucas. I'm from Austria. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, if there is like some, or if you could elaborate on a mechanism of solidarity between the cooperatives. Is there, if there is like a structure for, because of course, like maybe some project is like very fortunate with resources or whatever and creates an abundance. And if then there is like a mechanism how they can support other collectives or if it is expected or not. Thank you. So you again. Uh, we had a long list of questions, but I just really want to ask one. Uh, what are the things that as we as policymakers or academics should question about our understanding in order to support solidarity networks? Okay, and you again. <laughs> well, mine was more on the lighter note, just out of curiosity, in which Eastern European countries have you worked with the Repis Network? And do you have plans or ambitions moving to southeastern Europe, preferably, or is it going to remain uh, just a gray area of everything? 
Okay. So you have no more than 15 minutes. <laughs> thanks. Thanks to the speaker and thanks to the audience. Please. Okay, so Lucas, um, actually, uh, solidarity economy is about the collaboration and interaction and federation and forms of uh, interlinking different initiatives, or as someone said before, instead of scaling up, multiplying or germinating, as, as we say. So um, what does that mean? That <clears throat> you, um, some of our initiatives are about recreating the supply chain in a cooperative way, um, the whole supply chain. So from the seed uh, exchange to the uh, you know the, the the cultivation the transformation the the, the, the reuse of of uh, uh, whatever are the residual materials for other productions um, and and therefore more circular kind of economy um, the the way it is distributed so um, the sort of solidarity logistics uh, and synergy among among the distributors, because we want to avoid to do the, the, the production and then give it to the supermarkets. Um, this is a whole debate, for instance, that there has been in the fair trade movement. Part of the fair trade movement said, well, if we want to really increase uh, the, the possibility for small farmers in the south of the world, um, I hope don't use that term anymore, but um, uh, then we need to have larger distribution in, in, uh, in the north. Um, today, that <clears throat> we're, we're questioning that a lot because you lose uh, uh, the uh, sort of the, the meaning of what you have done by interrupting that supply chain and even depending on the criteria of selection uh, and of price determination of the big supply chain, the big uh, distributors. So if you can create alternative distribution chains, collaborating among the different uh, initiatives, then you have really continued at, on, up to, let's say it's uh, producing bread or producing beer or producing whatever, um, we look at really Till the the last uh, ring of the uh, of the chain, and then how to bring them together in a uh, in a in a in a ecosystem where you also have collaborative forms of financing and a, and of resource generation because you cannot decouple which is what happens many times, um, the economic dimension or productive dimension or service from the financing. And nowadays, a lot of the SSE initiatives depend on credit coming from a traditional uh, finance, uh, a bank or, and, and we have, we have fi cooperative financing that is zero interest. Um, but it's a really big effort that you have to do and it has to be at a local level and it's based on trust relation and a lot of these things that otherwise a uh, uh, traditional institution cannot do. But not all cooperatives are cooperative. So that's, <laughs> that's certainly uh, uh, an issue. Um, what should, can, can you reformulate your question? What should academics, where is it? Uh, no, which one? What are the things that we as policymakers and academics should question about our understanding to better support social and solidarity networks? Um, hmm. Well, uh, I think as academics, um, you should question the very uh, sectoral approach that academy many times has, and, and instead improve and, and promote the multidisciplinary approach. 
which is really a, a, a way to understand better um, uh, also the dynamics and, and, and the, the, the perspectives. Um, and also how to make policies, how to make uh, that are more the, uh, how to say, um, instead of, 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 of uh, confining or closing in a definition, in a norm, um, uh, helping the, uh, the emergence uh, by more defining the, 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 the framework to protect it. Okay, so uh, if you want cooperative forms to, to thrive, you have to protect them from the speculative and um, uh, competitive forms to take over. Uh, so you have to, um, we, we see this for instance, um, when you have a European uh, law on uh, what food you can sell, um, and, and, and trade and the regulations that are for, for, for that in, in the community policy, uh, the European community, agricultural community policy uh, that are made for the big industry. And when you have small production and transformation, you cannot cope with the costs that are necessary to have that kind of uh, production and transformation, which is made for big numbers. So you have to have sort of a, a, the possibility of, 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 of differ, differentiating the, the rules that are needed at a local or translocal level with the global instead kind of a trade economy. All these are the things I think that are, <clears throat> are, are needed. And the fact that there's not one model, but there's, really each each methodology has adapt to to the need and the context uh, etc but it but it can be revolutionary in the sense it can really transform um, in in a in a positive way and and uh, disrupt the the, the past really i think now there's a window of opportunity which is huge with the whole discussion on energy. Uh, um, so we're rediscussing the role of fossil fuel extraction, etc. Finding a lot of, of course, um, difficulty in doing it because there's still a lot of interest in it. Um, but the war in Ukraine has uh, really brought up this issue in a this is not the, bad, the best way to do it, but I mean, it has shown the dependencies that uh, uh, countries have uh, on energy supplies and on concentrated and, 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 and long distance energy supplies. While we can reconceptualize totally the way we produce and distribute energy and make citizens controllers of that and, and even owners of the uh, means of production of, of, of energy which also uh, avoids a lot of dispersion uh, of, of, of energy in the transportation or, or things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's really a win-win thing, but we have to convince um, that you cannot just change an industrial model to another, uh, but you really have to completely revolutionize the, the, the way the economy is, is uh, organized. And then there was another question. The last, ah, yes. Southeastern Europe. So we've been working with, um, with mostly Central Eastern Europe countries, but um, we have a, a strong partners in Croatia. Uh, Finally, Serbia also or is, is emerging a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we don't have 
that much dialogue uh, yet with uh, be because I think we're, we're doing things differently with, with the NGO world um, and the, the non-governmental cooperation which is present in, uh, in and we're quite critics sometimes with with what they do um, but some of but with some maybe we can uh, uh, we can dialogue but we we're more interested with the of course with the local communities and there there's an issue of language and uh, uh, an issue of sort of uh, internal cooperation so <clears throat> we've been trying to push for regional networking um, and there is a first little a few little networks um, balkan sort of networks that that are sort of starting to but they're they're very focused on um, specific things like uh, agriculture like renewable energy not on a com on, on a sort of more uh, general solidarity economy kind of uh, vision if um, <clears throat> our coordinator the coordinator of of Repas Europe is from Croatia. Um, so we're hoping they will uh, push push more for, uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you.